Let's get started with this thing. We've got three poets laureate tonight, and we have one, what would you call it? Uh, I, the way I've been describing him as a freight train rolling thunder, uh, a griot with a voice and a set of lungs that would make Bessie Smith want to open the door and say, step inside, you are the real competition. Uh, he's not here yet, but he will be soon, I'm sure. Um, I have two, two messages before we get started on this thing. Uh, the first one is that, first of all, you students, I may be 64 years old, but I also know what it's like not to have lots of money. And what I would say to you is there is lots of food over there. Some of you have had been in my class and I've said bring baggies with you when you come to these things. When you go on to your university afterwards, make sure you know how to, take, to get baggies. I could tell you stories about what Sue and I did when we were students, but I'm not going <laughs> to. Okay. That's the first one. It's okay, they, don't, they can't save the food anyways, they don't mind, I wanna make sure you get fed best I can. Second one is these white sheets that are on here. Um, in or, now some of you have heard this a hundred times already, please forgive me. Uh, in order to get the second part of the grant, we have to have a good record of who came, how many people were here, uh, what sorts of, you know, whether they were students, public, uh, GRCC employees or other. and. Um, we also need to get a sense of, um, to a certain extent, if you have comments on the readings tonight, um, they are welcome. I'll keep a running track of that later on. Um, I have to file this thing by May 5th in addition to grading my final exam papers, final exam essays. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna be a hell of a, of a month, this one. <laughs> Luckily, I've got some very patient students. So uh, that will be at the end of the reading, and I will bring that up to you before. So without much further ado, and you have to forgive me, I've been going 12 hours a day for the, this is the third day in a row, so I might be a little bit wordy. Sue would tell you I always am. Uh, uh, Patricia Clark is our second Poet Laureate of Grand Rapids. She is the uh, poet in residence at Grand Valley. If any of you get into the writing, writing program at Grand Valley, you will be probably in some ways connected with her. Um, uh, I've grown to know her as a friend over the last few years and, and I've really grown to appreciate uh, what she has done there. So, Patricia, it's all yours. Thank you. Okay, I'm testing here. Who was it who said the other night, if you can hear me, if you can't hear me, let me know. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, does it? Um, <clears throat> thank you. It's really an honor to be here. And, you know, David Cope is the reigning genius of this thing, so we need to give him a big hand, don't we? <laughs> um, it's, it's really fantastic. And, and GRCC is fantastic to host this and have it support the literary arts. Um, it's just fantastic. Uh, and then you all for being here too on a beautiful night when you should be out wandering around and looking at the redbud trees or something. Um, it's nice that you've come inside. I'm going to try and get my coffee to not slide down and I'm just going to look here quickly at my thing. So anyway, thank you. I'm Patricia Clark and I thought I'd just launch right into uh, some poems. I think I'll tear this out, because that's my list, and then I know. We'll start with some song. This is called Ostein, Ostein. Singing tribes from hidden perches, from stems and blossoms, honeysuckle, trumpet vine, clematis, from a cottonwood's high branch or the top spire, of the white pine, this warbling, crooning, cooing. Seldom from the ground, from a low place, why is that? Some fast hold with security, safety, a haven, or something about shade, semi-dark, coolness, looking out, and then to lift one's voice, here. From the echo tone, edges, margins, Trees into field, lawn into hem of the woods. Riverine bank, creek, tree limb, 
from the tree's dark trunk, rain slick, from the leaf's umbrella shade, song to braid this new day, or darkening gloom, notes to send out, testing what the voice can do, trills, legato, runs and rasps, rattle of tongue against palate, mix of ecstasy, elegy, sound into art. Uh, the river is a place I go, and uh, gosh, it it speaks to me. And uh, you know, it's not really words, but then you get home and something happens. So, uh, a few river, a few watery poems. This is called "By Clear and Clear, Riverside Midday." The old self dying away. You can feel it can hear a skeletal crack, then snap as a ridge line breaks all down the thorax, the bony carapace splitting, a faint odor lifting off, burnt hair from a wet sizzle, the new lying there almost fetid with freshness, with its own moist softness, fetal or maybe just larval, tender, exposed, on all sides water, this again, the spit of land, liminal, pelagic, far from dry, your very steps leaving an imprint in grass. Tomorrow you could return, matching your prints to the day before. This day, a child's game, is that where the fractures go? Now you walk emancipated, on the loose, out of the house, its stale air, parents gone at last, grown up, free. I'm from, you know, I'm not from Grand Rapids. Maybe I shouldn't have been the poet laureate of the city. I didn't tell them that. <laughs> Seattle is my uh, stomping grounds and salt water really more than, uh, uh, than river water, but I'll, I'll take the river. <laughs> This is called Air Like a Sea. I noticed the willow's long fronds hung down, crimped like ringlets, just unwrapped. And some bird song, notably the robins at midday, came out ragged, a bit rusty, and not so liquid. New leaves bore a fuzz like the newborn's fontanel without the throb though everything on the wing seemed to be alighting, building, catching up a catkin in its beak or scouting for worms or grubs. I wanted to place a finger on the day's pulse, making it pause. My fingernails like shells, the day's air, a sea rolling in, filling space around me, raising the beached kelp to sway alive, like hair. <laughs> that was a weird noise. What was that? <laughs> that was a snap. Hey. Is that a ZZ? <laughs> yeah, I, I thought, is that a, is that a, a cicada? Is that a, <laughs> what in the hell is that? <laughs> I can say hell in here, can't I? I can. <laughs> he does. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, sometimes water then uh, takes you to darker things. So, uh, dar you know, who knows? <laughs> this is uh, after uh, a Hiroshigi print. After Hiroshigi. Two men working in skiffs on the river Serba one poling a full load of wood bundled for fires on shore, and another reaching in with a gaff, wrist wet, lapped by water to check the river's depth. His rice plants, are the seed heads full? Is the crop ready for harvesting? A full moon balloons half a tree height above the horizon, both men too busy to notice how it is snagged in the branches of a willow 
swept nearly bare, Willow leaning identically as the second man bends, shore reeds tipped to the right also, marked by prevailing wind. Good to focus on the task at hand, afloat on river water. If you look up at sky, the star field, as I did one recent morning, in mid-footfall on blacktop, down a darkened street with the dog, counting by tens up to 100, 200 before slowing, letting breath huff out. If one pauses to look, staring, the brittle icy stars can shock you. What else besides the heavens neglected by me for months? <clears throat> now a slap of recognition, this sliding back into my skin. Diamond white stars, black sky, the hunter's figure showing clearly. I embraced every contradiction of newfound sight, the vast distance from the river Serba to this place, the utter loveliness of being a speck on a watery planet wobbling through space. The two men go on bending to their task. I step outside in dark with the dog and wood heaped on that distant shore, crackles of fragrant fire, red gold flame gleaming by wet rocks Run, one, where I warm my hands. Oh, that made me think suddenly. I hope you've been watching the sky, this show of Venus and Jupiter. And they said for a while, five planets out there doing their thing. And I think tonight should be really good. Guess I need a telescope. Stan, Christmas. <laughs> I want to have a telescope. Once we went out and we tried to find Kissing Rock Road. You know where that is? That's where the observatory is. And we got so lost for hours. It was raining. I don't know what the explanation. It was before GPS. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I love the name, Kissing Rock Road. You know, people, sh what? He, I bet he does. People should go tonight after the reading. <laughs> now we're getting down to it. Um, another river, rivery poem, and this is an elegy for a friend's uh, sister. Elegy for Wilma. I got to have a little jo uh, Java here. Mm. <clears throat> Along the river in November, thin red canes bend, bramble of some berry I can't identify. Dark brown pods, half a finger's length, burst open to show white filaments, each carrying a nugget at its tip, frail cargo, half of them gone on the wind. I notice how each plant finishes the year, milkweed, motherwort, everlasting pea. My friend gone on a journey south down through Ohio fields to comfort her twin sister must sit by now at her deathbed, touching warm skin of a hand that matches her own, halves of a split egg some 70 years ago. As the room fills, with music, light, then grays thickening, only to drain of dark come dawn, then starting the cycle again. Can the native plants along the river, grasses too, tell daylilies, tell us anything of foreboding? When the northeast wind blows, skidding across water, they bend and papery capsules crack quite predictably along the seams. Rattled seeds spilling to earth, not knowing the harder part of winter's coming. They ready for it as they can, with dispersal, needing no word for it. One summer I got to go to France. Wow, that was really uh, interesting. Interesting place. <laughs> 
really good food in France <laughs> and people who speak French. <laughs> and uh, we were in a town, uh, Ovilar, Ovilar, beautiful town, where the pilgrims come walking through. They walk all the way from I don't know where, down through the Pyrenees, down into Italy. Apparently, you can you have to walk so many miles to get a certificate, but you can go a, a short distance, like, I don't know, 50 kilometers or something. So I'm thinking, Stan, the <laughs> ne not next year. <laughs> you get a bicycle, yeah. Well, uh, we met a man in Ovilar who had rented a mule. You can rent mules in France. And, uh, and then you can go to dinner and put the mule behind the restaurant and hobble it in a field behind a restaurant. It's a very interesting place. So this is called Until It Speaks. Maybe my ears are made mostly for reasons of symmetry, balance, like the way I feel about rivers. You can't really get them to speak to you with a short acquaintance. If you walk there on a first or second try, notice frogs taking leave of the bank. And you check out a blue rowboat, pensive as a lover moored and forlorn at a landing. Walked half a mile, nothing yet spilled into the ears, wrought into words. For starters, you have to be willing to step into the long grasses beyond to pass the soothsayer's maison recently abandoned upon her death, to go there again at dawn, then after dark, to the Garonne's banks. What did you say you were willing to do? Think a year or more. Think learning a new palette of riverine words. There is one dictionary for its dialect, left open at the soothsayer's desk a pencil mark in the margin at the word raiment. Isn't it how we dress our indifference as though anyone were coming, strolling along to be fooled? <clears throat> I think another panel that would be good, maybe another year, David, at this conference would be about, <laughs> or maybe we did talk about it a little the first day, is where poets get ideas and for their poems, and it's all over the place, but certainly, you know, NPR, you know, things that they talk about on the radio, um, a word of the day that you get sent to you from the um, Merriam-Webster, you know, there's just lots of places. So I heard this term, zodiacal light, and I thought, how cool, and I looked it up, maybe it was earth and sky, and they just talked about this phenomenon, this, uh, really cool light that, that you can see, but the conditions have to be exactly right, and I forget what those conditions are now, but it doesn't matter. The, it gave me a poem, which I made into a little bit of a dialogue, and I think you'll hear it in the, because there are questions and then there are answers. So it's called Zodiacal Light, a Dialogue. To see it, you look to the north, but you must not be in the north. How can I see it then? You must take a long drive south. How early must I rise? Before early light, when stars yet gleam. Which part of the sky to study? Learn the horizon, your planet's curve. The description spoke of a pyramid shape. Can I expect that? You will see dust shimmer, rise, drift, golden particles, astral pollen. Could I begin driving tonight? You will find impediments, weather, blockades. What can I do to circumvent those? Your way will be longer, a season's detour. Must I give up a whole year in the wait? Sometimes a year is the least particle. Eyewitnesses agree, a soft glow, unearthly. Can the last word be right? Did you listen well? I believe in the holy name, 
the journey long and good. These are not the northern lights. They are something else entirely. And for this, I have waited these many years. I think finally, and maybe we've talked about this at the conference, that the range of poetry is wide. And maybe everything goes into poems, finally. Maybe everything goes in. And that, <laughs> that makes it complicated for readers, maybe, because you think, well, then what's a poem? But um, I keep trying to put everything in. God bless you. Uh, it's allergy season. See, allergies belong in, pollen. So this is called math architecture. I keep a basket full of riffraff stones, a patch of bark, a length of wood. There's a feather in inch-wide gray-white stripes, chunks of feldspar, one piece of beach glass small enough to be a pinky's fingernail in green. I favor the organic and the mute. They sit together well, lie at my left. Often I count window panes doing the math of glass times glass or door transformed to window. Two large fields so clear the white pine steps closer with each shiver. Slant the roof up, it'll seem larger. From this roost I see it all, so deep and clear your wrist will burn if dipped in there. Air, water, mix, and stir. I think three more. Oh, I lied, four. I promise, that's it. Um, there's a really neat book called, that Barry Lopez edited, Home Ground, Language for an American Landscape. I don't know if any of you have that book, but it's filled with vocabulary words that writers from all around the country wrote the definitions for. And um, I've stolen many things from this book. It's just really great. And Barry Lopez, I don't know if you read him, he's a very deep guy. So this is a word that I saw in there, quebrada, and uh, I think I riffed off their definition into my own, quebrada. If the ground is torn, pebbled, cracked, showing a breakup of ground has occurred, one leading to a rupture of landscape, horizons, passes, this is quebrada. Do you hear the lament crackling through its syllables? Oh, my lost footing, my sister, see how fisher-like all my ravines have become. Where a mountain stream might break out of a canyon or gully, quebrada the land at its source. At one family's beginnings, five girls, and only far later, the twin boys, a last boy, the breaks. Then years of splitting, separating, the centrifugal whirling away to a state of entropy, or call it heat death, though for a time no one saw the country beyond. The ground goes on quaking, trembling, as though giants trod here, our parents down, deadfall trunks prone along the creek, stripped gray, bare. You know, there are, um, of course, a lot of poetic forms, but then there's one, I bet some of you have used it. It's called a cento, an Italian form, and you get to steal all the lines from other poets. You just take them all and you put them in and you arrange them in whatever order you want. Um, the thing I recommend, though, if you do this, remember who the, you stole them from. So later you might need to credit them. And don't ask me right now whose these are because I've forgotten. No, I wrote them down somewhere. Uh, this is a, a cento, and it's short. <clears throat> See if you can hear who, who's, which writers these are. Although things vanish are what mark our vanishing. Homer ready to be led around the known globe. Eight days ago, I stood where he stood. The shadows of the floating world huddle 
beneath their objects. How I thought of several explanations for your grief, but the wind has sown loose dreams on one side, the soul wanders. So cruel then that each star be our jewel. The high windows, the statues, the grand brothers and sisters who live after us. So just two more. There's even poetry, I think, in geology, and uh, I wish I had taken a class. Maybe I will now. But there's uh, one great thing about being at a university. You have colleagues from other areas, and this uh, professor in geology said they were going to go down into the mines under Grand Rapids, these um, gypsum mines. Did I want to go? I thought, wow. She said that she was going to think maybe have her students write poems. God bless you. But I said, yes, I would go, forgetting that I'm claustrophobic and that, you know, it, and she said we had to have hard hats, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a, a little bit about that journey. And uh, I recommend, I guess some of you have been there. Yeah, I see your head shaking. A lot of, it's known. They store pizza down there, I think, now, and paper. Pizza and paper. That's all I got from it. Have you been down there? That's an of oh, Paris. Thought you were going to be in Italy. <clears throat> so this is called Rocks and Minerals. I stood as sure of him as stone, as gravity, as white oak tree trunk 80 feet up in the yard. Solid, I called him, when others named him air, cloud, Pine needle cluster fragile, wisp of seed blown from a milkweed, flower of chocolate Joe Pie weed, dandelion. Should never have slept sure of him as sun touching forearm skin after winter's length as pillow for my sore head. Others warned, but I thought, no, not him, not me. This substance is feldspar, epidote, limestone, even better, dolomite. Instead, pussy willow, snow melt, sandstone worn by water. He cannot stay true to season, lover, friend. The gypsum mine we, I climbed down into late summer gaped wide halls in some parts. Others, narrow passageways where we had to sloop, stoop, excuse me, slog through water and muck before coming out, a few of us still bent over. I had worn the wrong boots, smooth soles with no tread, and thank the moon, a few others held me up. I would have gone down flat. And I'm going to end with a, with a poem about my refrigerator and something I found in there. Um, you know, there are weird things that happen, that grow. <laughs> um, so this is called Stowaway in the Arugula. A lighter green, almost yellow, than the notched leaves of the arugula twist tied in bunches with six of them bound together in a plastic bag. I glimpsed you among one, folded like a tripod, in the midst of that group, stems of the plant like bars rising to cage you in. Dead, I thought at first, before seeing half of one antenna wave and twitch. How warm the kitchen must have felt after the fridge's tomb, then a rush of water draining in the sink. Oh, small traveler, grasshopper hitchhiking its ride, Air Freight from California. What could I do but wish you well? As a West Coast transplant myself, I wanted to say good luck with months of coming dark. Let it be enough that I held you in my palm for a few minutes, carrying you outside like an elevated host before setting you down. All of us go down into green unknown. Thank you.
do I? Yeah, go ahead, do it twice. Okay, so uh, Rod Torreson is next. Um, third poet laureate called shots on the New York Yankees. Also through the Third Eye website. Um, he's done as much as anyone in this city for the youth of this city finding their way in poetry. Please welcome Rod. Well, uh, uh, I, it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks, David, for everything that you've done for the city of Grand Rapids not just for us, but for everybody. And like I told him er earlier, he's a very generous man. I, it, it was many years, I went many years without uh, seeing him. I, I saw him about 19, in 1980 or 81, and he doesn't remember this. There's no way he could. But, uh, but, but I remembered it, and so I saw him here at Barb Sonier's uh, uh, poetry reading three years ago, and that was the first time, but I heard so much about him, and it's kind of an kind of amazing to me that we could kind of keep missing each other for so many years. But anyway, um, uh, I'm going to start with, a, with a one rural poem, although I have two books, uh, one published and one uh, that I have not begun to send around yet on, on uh, the rural theme. And uh, this is I, Robert, uh, Robert Francis uh, in... Uh, Book uh, pot shots at, uh, at poetry that he that he wrote many years ago said that the first poem in a reading is one that I mean you, I mean basically it doesn't matter how good it is because everybody's going to miss it. So with that in mind, I have a poem that is slightly salacious, slightly, and it probably doesn't bother you, but it bothers me. So I thought I'd start with that one. <laughs> Something is going on far back of the ancient lawn. Something is going on far back of the ancient lawn, past the regalia of roses about the arbor, with its vines tracing the braided rivulets of sun, past the bird bath, that vaunted podium of birds, and the feeder where two cardinals and now a nuthatch have trimmed enough sky beneath their wings to come down. But beyond the bushes, father planted for windbreakers and a run of weeds that went to seed and made a jungle stop short by a fence. Some of it lazy and lying down before a dirt lane wide enough for a tractor and baler to cross from one field to another, not to be snagged by that fence or the one intertwined with roots and rusted wire where stands of string of plum trees you'd forget about through the school year where dollops dusted by rain have filled your palm. Plums grown too big for their skin and with teeth marks of the sun, a glisten barely punctured, where secretions ooze for the loll of your tongue. Past all of this, a view of the neighbor's farmhouse, a screen door always banging, where a dip of a girl in a summer skirt walks suddenly out, looks over her shoulder to be sure no one is watching, and hanging a hard left at the corn crib, her blouse untucked and fly, almost flying up, comes running. This next poem, uh, I just wrote a couple years ago. In fact, I decided tonight I was just going to read poems that I've written in the, in the last nine or 10 years and leave all my old tired standards alone. But uh, this is about a, uh, a situation that uh, my, see, my, my, my son and I went to a gas station probably 22 or 23 years ago, and there was a shootout that had been going on in the west side. And I was appalled by, uh, this shootout had gone on for quite a few hours. And it seemed like it, it must have been all over the radio because I think every weird person in the city happened to show up and they had their kids you know up on their shoulders watching it and it was just like an athletic event I just couldn't believe it but uh, uh, we uh, 
this is about that experience. And I, first of all, I, I didn't know what was happening. And then I, uh, I was only there for a couple of minutes, and then I left right away. But it's called Showdown on Carroll Street. Getting out at the Amico to pump, connecting the lifeline, my son still in the back seat. I didn't sense it. Behind us on the street side of the corner house, the dangerous crowd chanting, shoot, shoot, shoot. Men standing, tot straddling their shoulders. Older kids lit up over cans of pop. Women slung out in halter tops, their laughter loud as their bare, careless midriffs. Shoot, shoot. Once in a while, the chant collapsing on itself, a hot dog there and here, then gunshots, a quick popping of corn, a man inside the house you'd learn later so keyed into his truck that he wouldn't surrender it. Upstairs, holed up at the neighbor's sharpshooters, riding the windows, maybe revolving the long barrels of their rifles, the quietest of propeller blades into place, then for effect strafing the aluminum siding of the house, you imagine them with thin measured mustaches, each deftly working a tree limb, culling a view. Below, a man whose voice rises above the others. Come on, guy, shoot your way out. I put back the pump nozzle, my wallet, a quick beating of wings to help my car fly out of there. And I don't write many poems about Grand Rapids. I think I've always wanted to escape, you know. Growing up, growing up I mean, I don't mean that in a bad way, uh, but I... <laughs> But I don't know, growing up with a family and everything, I'm the kind that there could be a lot of good things going on, and there's one bad thing, and that, that's, what I sent, that's what I seem to think about. And, uh, and, I, and the, if my kids had problems or something like that, I would, I would worry about them. And then I was afraid if I got them into a poem, uh, I didn't know what was going to happen to them. Or I might write such a good poem, or the one that I like so much, that then I could never share it with, with, with anybody. So... Um, I, but this is about Grand Rapids. It's about a garage sale that I uh, went to a couple years ago. I think, Barb, you helped me with this poem, didn't you? You don't remember. It's, she's, she's, she's helped me with a lot of poems over the years. Garage sale. From a radio across tables, lazy with disarray, on a day that may be realized in rain, Wafts, I can't stop loving you. The soothing strains have towed the clouds away, affirming, too, that love is in the aging. Browsing the books and CDs, I am suddenly aware of two women and a man, each like me, middle-aged but unmindful of the others, singing softly with Ray Charles as if to vows sustained. Honeyed by Ray's song, the sun finds what shines in gloomy pans, sunken tins, cupboards on the lawn, and this fading man, balding and wearing jeans, buoyed by this song, by two women and a man, the women who've lost one beauty and gained another, one holding at arm length a skirt, lifting it like yesterday into Ray's sweet song, I see her now as younger, one clothespin between her teeth, another in her hand while her husband embraces her from behind, just one sweet memory she may have pinned to the line. Before the song ends, cryptic emblems on silverware handles shall be understood. Days will ripen on the vine. I... Uh, I'm in the process of, uh, well, I, I, I spent probably a dozen years on my, base, my book of baseball uh, poems that uh, was published by Storyline Press. And I, I've always had a hard time getting my po individual poems published, but, but uh, I had that accepted uh, the first time I ever sent it out. And then my rural book, um, 
uh, was solicited by, by Western, and that was published. Uh, but my gosh, the individual poems have been always very hard for me. Um, but anyway, I, I had this whole book of poems built around the theme of music now, and I've been writing those for 12 years. And I thought it, I would just read a, uh, those tonight and kind of st steer clear of the baseball poems, which I think if Barb Saunier hears one more, she's probably <laughs> going, to, going to barf, you know. <laughs> but this is, this is about Ray Davies, uh, true story, uh, front man for the... Uh, for the kinks. A year before New Orleans is immersed in water, before city walls give way with a shrug, Ray Davies, former front man of the kinks, walks with his woman on the fringe, fringe of the French sector close to Bourbon Street, walks from what might call charming squalor, flesh in leisure, maybe a little twist of clouds in the sky. Surely he looks older. Surely his hard edges now take soft journeys down his jawline. Surely old songs like you really got me deaden his bloodstream. But then it's like that opening riff all over again when the power cords nearly derail as a car stops in the middle of the street. One thug at the wheel, the other testing his mugger's luck, creates haste with a shotgun fresh in each face, snatches her purse as if it's on clearance. The whole street sold to darkness, and Ray, in his prickly inequality from being at the top, explores the bottom. Caution doesn't churn, but instincts rush him as he gives chase to the mugger's small horizon before lead pummels him, his right thigh leaping out behind, leaving in one place his remainder. Ray Davies, shaker of death, at ease with being unsettled again, down on the sidewalk and not even sharing the seed of a scream. Now we get to Elvis, and I've, uh, I've, uh, for mo for the most part, I've never been an Elvis fan. I, I think it was a little slightly before my time, but I always hated songs like "Love Me Tender." I thought it was uh, about the worst song in the world, but and I always thought he wasted his voice. That that he finally found it later on his, in his career when he was singing songs like Suspicious Minds and Kentucky Rain. But I, he, I thought he had to go through a lot of terrible stuff to get there. And I hope if you, if some Elvis fans want to throw stones at me later on, I'll go over there and stand against the wall. But I, but I, I did like a couple of his songs a great deal. At the Elvis Motel. At the Elvis Motel, you see him buckled into his pants at the head of a longhorn. Billfold on a chain, deep pointed boots as if to keep Elvis from falling out as he keys the door. You wonder what gradient of ghost he is. His other hand has the motel by a doorknob. Once it was the world. He blows to you about recent hauls to Montgomery and Memphis, as if to beat you to the thought. He says that he impersonates Elvis, but nothing all, but noting all the bugs about his head as if he is a street light or the light of this world, you dismiss it at once. Later in his room next to you, he is singing Love Me Tender. You imagine him flying by his tr trucker thick sideburns and wonder about pills under his pillow in this shabby motel where TV is everything and carpet is mushed up like milk toast. You wonder, you know you're just jealous when you ponder his wasted life of poor songs and drugs. So you kneel by the keyhole to his door and inhale snore after snore until you hear a standing ovation at Madison Square Garden and he is saying you've been a good audience as if he's about to slip back into his life. The next day at checkout, the old clerk in a young ponytail calls him Elvis as if she doesn't know who Elvis is. 
but the trees outside fill with birds as he walks to his rig and wind feels gingerly around his styrofoam cup of coffee and blows him holding it across the road into dark plowed fields. Uh, the next poem is, called, is about Jeff Buckley. Um, Jeff Buckley's father, uh, Tim Buckley, was a noted uh, folk singer who's been pretty much forgotten. Uh, and uh, he committed suicide uh, probably in 68, 69, something like that. Well, his son, Jeff Buckley, um, probably about 15 years ago, came out with an album. Um, and it's most noted f for introducing a song to our culture called Hallelujah. Uh, I've been a Leonard Cohen fan since 1968. I, was, I, felt, I felt like I was the only 17-year-old in, uh, in Northwest Iowa who knew, knew who Leonard Cohen was. And it pleases me. I, I mean, I just looked over his reviews for his, his, re his most recent album, Old Ideas. He's at 77 years old. His... Uh, his uh, uh, new album uh, uh, came out number one in uh, probably about 10 uh, countries in the world and in the top five in, in, in 15 or 20. Uh, and, and at that time, hardly anybody knew him. They might have known his song, Suzanne, that, uh, that Judy Collins um, uh, sang. But uh, they didn't know Cohen. But anyway, this is about Jeff Buckley, who, who uh, perhaps committed suicide like his father. But I'll let the poem tell the rest of the story. Jeff Buckley sows his voice to the seamless river. Maybe a splash of melody, and into the Mississippi he walks, fully clothed near Mud Island Harbor at sunset, just outside of Memphis where he laid down tracks in the studio. He sets down his final ones with his boots in his Ultimate t-shirt, wading deep into whole lot of love, singing it high and surely wide. His high, wavering lungs match the ghostly, operatic voice of Tim Buckley, his father. A passing riverboat crests waves upon his cheeks. His friend on the shore who turned back spins around and Jeff Buckley's gone. The current's breach already healed. No call for help. An immaculate departure. As if his voice that lonely mansion found itself on another shore, as if he'd carried in him a secret known only to the bearded trees and silken moon, his death sweet as a lilac wine beneath the linden trees in one of his songs. And then to keep his death pure and not a drag upon the river, a dense and lengthy showcase of rain appears before his body is found as a floating neglect of his spirit out in the reaches where we teeter. Is it? What's that? Pardon? Ten to? About five minutes? Um, oh, gosh, I don't know about this poem. It's, a mirror, it's an embarrassing but it's true. Oh, of course, that should stop me right there. <laughs> Kissing was everything. First the teen dance, the mayhem of the catch at 1 a.m., then to the car for carousels of kisses. Kisses whirling us over the top, the roller coaster, hair flying kisses, heaving us up from our seats, heads mixing it up with a scuffed upholstery near the dome light. Our kisses making waves up the street lights on Marshall and out into the sky toward WDGY in Bloomington, where Boom Boom Bailey, the DJ, was saying, I got this vibe to play Palisades Park. 
Later, boom, boom, spinning Eli's coming by three dog night and leaving on a jet plane by Peter, Paul, and Mary. Each hour's clinch pin in the spin rotation when our bags are packed, ready to go. She kissing every boy in the whole wide world and I every girl. No braces, though I sense the jet plane and the slight metallic aftertaste of gum. Tongues <laughs> diving, fluttering, mine upon the lithe, succulent L sound in Valerie. She a dormless girl, kissing my lips somewhere beyond me. Her mouth a lighthouse, warning to stay clear of her heart. And leaving on a jet plane, dawn was breaking off the night with a taxi's horn, giving each kiss an urgency as an old man passed by walking his dog, and the drugstore we parked by awakened light by light. I think I'll, I'll just read one more. This is, uh, my, my son is, uh, uh, well, he... He re, uh, a year and a half ago, he graduated from the seminary. He's a Lutheran minister in, in, in Missouri. But uh, it gave us the opportunity to uh, uh, visit St. Louis quite a few times. And uh, I, I found out that Chuck Berry um, still played uh, once a month. And uh, I've always been a fan of his music. And uh, this is about uh, one of those experiences. And this is probably about five five years ago now, and he's still doing this um, at 86. Out over the edge of St. Louis, my son, daughter, and I stroll the old Delmer Loop. We're at 81. Chuck Berry still shakes out in appearance one Wednesday a month, but beneath the big bare moonbeams, it's Saturday night. As my heartbeat hunts down the feel of this city, the stamp of the street with its brass plaques embedded in the sidewalk commemorating, among others, Barry, Miles Davis, and Cheryl Crow. We brush by two girls with a bruised blonde look, hear the sidewalk shouts of two men a block apart, one yelling, hey man, I'm locked out, the other, no shit. It's a second time today. <laughs> Close by, coins click <laughs> into the poised world of a parking meter, and I can almost feel the dusk as it drains into the footsteps of a young man now walking down the street named a year later in 2007, one of the 10 great streets in America. I glance down an alley where I'm sure at some time in its life a knife has tried to remove a wound. Hear a girl mid-teens raiding every young man passing by, me in the middle between my son and daughter as she screeches, God, no, he's too old. <laughs> primed, with, primed with good vibes, I recover a, a few as I swing open the door of the Blueberry Hill, a man takes my name, later shows us to a table. The walls are dressed out in the d decor of old concert posters and a long corridor to the bathroom. The proprietor is posed with every musician from Keith Richards to Solomon Burke and John Hartford. And I sit there tapping a foot to oldies playing nonstop through the speakers. It is suddenly Wednesday down in the duck room, standing room only. I rise in the raw applause for Barry, who steps out of a shadow with his Gibson, starts up its engine and breaks into Johnny Be Good. And I think of how something like tax evasion and misconduct tries to tower over him, but Chuck gives us the whole strength of the room and hops on one leg, the other bent at the knee, no conflicted cords, just Chuck Berry in his duck walk as the song finds its fire bed. And suddenly it is 1956, and I'm wherever he is the first time he does this. I am five years old at the bedrock of it all. And afterwards on the street again, the girl who was raiding the young men looks at me as if I'm some kid and grins. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hello, I'm
I'm going to uh, try and introduce David Cope in a way that pays tribute to what Rod said, is his generosity and a little bit of his life experience. Um, I wish I could write poetry. I always have, but I'm a novelist, and I seem to have scribbled a small book here, so bear with me. <laughs> really, you should see it <laughs> in purple pen. Uh, yeah. David Cope has published seven books of poetry, tuned into and in celebrating the lives of plain blue-collar folk, beginning with Quiet Lives in 1983, followed by On the Bridge in 1986, which won an American Academy Prize, and had him racing, as he describes, between New York, Boulder, Detroit, Rochester, and Brooklyn, meeting his peers and the wild daddies of the beat generation but also returning home to the loves of his life, Susie and his children, and also to the custodial job he held for many years before becoming a distinguished professor here at GRCC. Followed, following those first two titles came four, five, excuse me, five more collections of poetry, his most recent, A Mask of Six Decades in 2010. As a poet, he's worked with the likes of Allen Ginsberg and Ann Waldman. As a University of Michigan undergrad, he spent time protesting the Vietnam War and running from police in riot gear. Yeah. <laughs> His poetry is written from passion and humility and with, as he says, plain speech because plain folk want it clear even when life is wrapped in complexity. He's written environmental activist pieces, eco-poetics at Naropa, famed for the disembodied poetics of Kerouac. But again and again, he's a man whose poems have returned to celebrate 40 years of love, home, the garden, hiking, and kayaking. And to know David Cope, like I've come to know him, and many of you have, is to know a person of boundless energy and great stories. Right? <laughs> Here at G GRCC, he's helped to launch one conference after another. He's nurtured a once-fledgling once women's studies program into a series of classes and a tremendous website, all while mentoring new instructors such as Nora Neal and myself, and all while also being, and I think this is very telling and important, one, one of the instructors that my students most often cite as a life-changing mentor. Writers, poets, musicians, and Shakespeare lovers included. He's a man of many hats and costumes, as some of his students will attest. <laughs> He's just recently published his 50th issue of Big Scream, a journal of poetry that he has edited for 38 years, which is amazing for a small journal, if anybody knows the life of a usual small journal. And he's published talented students alongside with national and international voices. And now, as Poet Laureate of Grand Rapids, David is doing what he does best, bringing together and celebrating a community of voices. In this conference and in the upcoming anthology, Song of the Awashtenong, Grand Rapids poetry in the 21st century. Because for all that he has accomplished, there's not a bit of competition in David Cope. None of us, as fellow writers or the students that he's mentored, could have a better champion for our work. And to beat all that, I love it that he sometimes tears up when he's reading his poetry. <laughs> not that I'm setting a bar for you right now. <laughs> Don't, you don't have to go there. So please join me in welcoming poet, teacher, mentor, and friend extraordinaire, David Cope. You forgot one thing. I'm the biggest jackass on campus. I'll, I'll you to that. My wife wants to. Uh, 
Okay, so I like what President Ender said. I was a guy that would tell him what, what he didn't want to hear from anybody else. Because <laughs> I am one of those people that will not mince my words when I think somebody's full of bullshit. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna start with I'm gonna start with Benny. Uh, Custodian I worked with when I worked at Lincoln School. It was a member of the championship uh, Central High football team. Those of you who went to Central know how long ago that was and that happened. This is called The Job. Years later, he disgorged monthly, searching swamps and panties for the dead, eyes and treetops for snipers. He'd reach through muck and gassy water in tropical heat. Skin slid from arms like sausage casings. Arms and legs pulled loose from bloated bellies. Swollen eyes popped open, white with decay. Get the dog tags and drop the stinking meat into a body bag. Try to forget anxious parents, the high school sweetheart now in college, her perfumed letters. His radio flyer, buckskin fantasies, hip shake Watusi, and all those dreams of panting love tally him up. He couldn't explain to his girlfriends that how even in their most intimate moments, that death smell would come to him. He'd run shrieking into the light, shaking his tongue a babble of dead men's names. Even here, among the laughter of friends, he'd need you to hold his shaking hands. Again and again, trapped in that dream. I'm gonna tear up. <laughs> I love this guy. It was once a month we had to, we were working at Lincoln and he worked in the brown pod and he'd come down and say, Dave, I need to talk. We'd go out and I didn't smoke at that time, but we'd have a cigarette together and he'd have to tell me the same story every month. <sighs> Two-hearted river. Um, eyes like ravens over roadkill. Fingers flashing and reeling zebcos, the fishermen can't grasp that some come for the water itself, tan and red near shore, but so clearly a black mirror where no face appears, or for lichen rotted balsam firs lying like corpses across the flow stacked with flotsam and foam, feathers and bones the fallen gathered to spin in currents siphoned and spat down where the portagers put in with a quiet rush as cranes hang, almost still, in the turning sky above. Yet even the heart cannot fathom what stillness rests in this plunge, why men sing together like choir boys and stop the gunnel rush and lay the paddles down in the, in the whipping breeze where the scarred pines bend through storm and sigh and rainbows end. Nor is it clear what draws one to the mouth even as the last ice flows frozen and winter's roaring surge break free in great chunks, leaving the churned sand of November's waves again among agates below. Even the dramas of rescue at sea, the poignancy of a captain's last transmission, retold around a kitchen stove in paradise or Mackinac by old salts, now retired to muse through waning years with stormy Mondays in the names of the dead. Even that cannot pierce through this water to the lost bottom or read the runes in the lights of the caves, of the waves, excuse me. Blew that one big time. <laughs> lights of the waves. Okay. My cousin Ann Barber was working in the hospital on 911. She was in the emergency um, and basically they were told, stay on call, you will be working a 24 to 48 hour shift. This is in silence. Hour after hour, they waited in the ER, expecting the onrush of wounded and maimed. Yet there were only firefighters with smoke inhalation, cuts and bruises, hour after hour. The minutes ticking away. The dust not even settled, filling the winter garden the palm court, where no wounded walked, nor rescuers bore the maimed. Only the silence and the realization at last that none would come through the open door, beyond the shrieks and sighs and the endless roar. This 
the other side of the same thing, Haditha. I got the dry lips tonight. Mm. Haditha. Oh, I know about that. <laughs> you got the desert coming off your lips. All right, so Haditha. Mother and child bulleted as they knelt in prayer. Powder burns where the slugs entered and tore flesh, blood erupting into dry air. Even as Marines moved on to machine gun a man, his wife, his daughters, the blind old man, the father reading his Koran, the grandmother, mother, brothers, uncles. One survived, playing dead beneath the body of her brother, his blood covering, giving her life. I've always thought it was important to write about war. Ernest Hemingway said that the war brings out the worst and the best in us as human beings. Um, it is something you should not ignore because our country has had so many and because we are in some ways defined by it. Those of you in my 102s, you know how I cover PTSD. There's a reason for it. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna skip that one. We're gonna keep it fairly short tonight because I wanna save it up for the big man over here. Lost loves, uh, old man, slim boy and boy to be. I wake in the cold moon where even the crickets lie silent and the leaves hang in the flooding mist, black streets silent. Even the midnight screamers gone to bed at last and hear you though lost forever singing in my ear, feel your tender touch as you stroke my forehead. So many gone down the lost river, so many waiting now for you and me to join them, singing in some night apart, shadow faces alight with secret fires, love that floods even this room, if only we turn to it and make it ours. Okay, I'm gonna skip that one too. We're gonna go to the invisible keys. Those who know me well know that I am a, uh, Died in the wool, very deep uh, uh, blues and jazz fan. Um, I know those two forms of music very, very well. I'm very, very in love with the, the masters of those forms. And um, during the time when I was, um, God, Marianne, thank you. Thank you. Ah, sometimes the old fat boy hasn't got the brains of anything. <laughs> Thank God for friends. Um, it was a period when I was working as custodian. We weren't making enough money <clears throat> to pay our bills. And so the uh, slumlords would give me jobs where I would go and clean apartments. And um, there was this old guy in this one apartment house where I worked, uh, old John, who had played jazz piano. And uh, there were times, I actually wrote two poems about him, but this is the one about his death, um, which to me was... Uh, well, we'll see. The Invisible Keys. You all know the Invisible Keys on the piano? <clears throat> Dead. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dead old John, pi premier piano player, found sitting up on his toilet after three days not answering his bell. Yellowing sheet music, old records, unpaid bills piled on his dresser, clock radio blaring the latest hits, the morning news. Government checks stuffed, stuffed in the mailbox, unclaimed. No relatives, no claims for his things. Landlord to arrange his funeral. Three parts. Spot on the sax, he's on his knees making that thing scream just above the heads of the dancers who are humping it. Sea of heads, jumping in the dark, smoke haze up in the lights, and now it's John's turn. <clears throat> bass thumping, raw nerves, underground, raging, r raging river. He lights into those high keys, staccato, fingers flying faster and faster, sweat dripping off his eyebrows, crashing cymbal and snares and hi-hat clanging. And now that guitar coming in, sweet and low, trying to take it. Even the bouncers at the door look in, the dancers stop dead to watch or collapse into their seats exhausted. Take it, babe. That guitar out front, all alone, burning away sadness and anger, unpaid bills, careless loves, burning a bright new fire to get them all to that coming dawn, burning all desire away. 
leaving them quiet, breathing softly together at last. Part three. Somewhere, <clears throat> that old tune's floating up in a dingy hallway, one bare bulb hanging, and those keys are rolling, waves under fast fingers, and two floors up, a woman sobs alone on rumpled sheets, shattered glass on the floor, picture on her pillow, two lovers in white with a red rose. And hearing those notes again, she'll rise and she'll look out at the empty street, street lights going off in the lavender dawn, and she'll remember and embrace a tender moment in a room like this and sighing, wipe her eyes and fix her hair. Who knows who might turn up today? Toes still tapping to that old song. It's from my second book, and it's still one of my favorite poems of anything I've ever written. And you know, I don't usually like to brag about my poems, but I'm crazy about that one. I still am. <laughs> <laughs> I better do this because I'm not going to make it through this thing. I only got like three or four more, so hang on. We'll get to Z in a minute. Uh, the Rhododendron. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, I guess what I would say is my ultimate love poem for my wife, Sue. Um, there was an earlier poem where uh, I had recalled when we first fell in love, and, and one of the lines in it was, let's be famous lovers. <laughs> I don't know if that happened, but. <coughs> we are both gardeners. The road had. Taba, taba. Rich Trip to Light, fantastic. <coughs> the rhododendron. Sunlight through an open door. Crimson blooms swelling to burst. Who can say what love is? You take a friend in hand and roar down blind road after blind road, wandering through the private rooms in each other's hearts, sailing through whole histories of pain and rage to find a quiet morning, dew on the laurel leaves. Love is not in the eyes, in the heart, in the entryways. <laughs> in the entryways and hot spots of flesh, in heavy breathing. Love cannot be contained in soft areas, whispered at dawn. It is neither two together nor apart. The eye is in the hand. The heart is in the eye. The song exhaled and inhaled, and suddenly your dreams fill rooms where others pace and sing softly of what you were. Oh, love. Steady rain on the city of the dead. Teardrop on a granite peak. Clear day. Angel ghosts circling the flowering black oak in every long gone summer night full of thunder. Sunlight through an open door. Crimson blooms swelling to burst. Whew, that was a hard one to get through this time. So I got Fran, I got tender petals. No, I kind of left my mom and dad off on this one because I've been doing funeral poems for so long. At this point, I've got to walk away from them. <laughs> my, my dad and my mom died in the same season, and I had a, a well, some of you know that because you went to all that stuff. <laughs> I had about a year of, uh, of coming to terms with it in my poems, and you know, basically for two years after, or however long it was, talk, 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 talk. But I do have my Aunt Fran. Um, my family on my father's side are Quakers. They eventually had to become Presbyterians because there weren't any Quaker places in, in uh, Detroit where they moved. And uh, Frances was the oldest daughter. Um, as some people know, we are four generation Wolverines. Um, my my uh, Aunt Frances was a uh, very thin young woman who graduated with a master's degree from the University of Michigan in chemistry uh, in the late 30s at a time when women did not take these things. She was one of those driven women all of her life, and she had an enormous amount of tragedy. Um, but at the end, it was, well, you'll see. Fran, 
starts with my childhood. I see my parents still wailing in the living room, Argentina Street, a gray day, no wind, and out the window traffic flashing past, Aunt Fran's husband and son Dutch. My older cousin, who'd filled his room with electronics, a genius at 13, accident in the Rockies, and she in a hospital, her arm broken. My first memory of lives, faces, swept away from my life. Later, when the sun broke through, wondering where we go, I was six. And after that, Dutch's oak furniture arrived, <laughs> excuse me, his bed to be my bed, his mirror where my face would stare back, sigh and dream of love. And Fa Fran recovered, circled the world alone, sent me coins from England, Austria, Egypt, Japan, mysterious envelopes that arrived in the mail, worlds beyond my suburban sidewalks and mystery gardens where I'd pause before an open rose and lose a day in dreams. Later, her house burned. She escaped miraculously, settled and worked in Maryland as my, my parents' marriage cracked up. Grandpa died. I raged at fall in love and lost my heart. Until lost child, I found myself in Sioux. I found my father again and heard my long lost grandma's sighs. Fran, the oldest child who'd seen more and kept herself apart, learned to be alone. Yet after the loss and the fire and the years apart, she met her hail and danced in her 70s like a teenager. A few years without pain, a few years blooming in the fullness of her womanhood. Who guesses how much we can know even of those nearest us, how others cope and sing above their suffering. She'd refuse a funeral, would go home to lie with her hail these last months awaiting an end that now comes swiftly, and I, learning of it, sit with, my, <laughs> sit with my sisters and my family, my 50th birthday stilled with this quiet moment filled with her life, flocks of birds wheeling in slow motion, hovering around the feeder in winter snow. Okay, let's do tender petals and we'll skip Jerusalem. <laughs> I was gonna do the big one, but I guess not. Uh, my dearest friend, my blood brother, uh, Jimmy Cohen. Um, when I was a young poet, uh, Allen Ginsberg took a shine to my work, and I was very fortunate in that respect. And um, first, he was trying to help me get my first book together. And of course, those of you who know about him know that he was—he made me look like I was lazy. Um, that guy was 24/7, and his apartment was like a gigantic machine for poetry, um, even when he was in his 60s. Um, but he helped me for a great deal. I had a manuscript at that time of about 156 pages uh, for my quiet lives. And we began cutting it down, taking out the second, the second uh, drawer of poems and the third drawer of poems and struggling with lines in others. And there was a point where he got too busy with his own career after a summer of working with me. And so he gave me to Jim, who was one of his um, teaching assistants at Naropa at the time. And uh, Jim and I have reached the point, and I've explained this to a couple of people. Basically, we sometimes will have three to four very long emails back and forth to each other daily. Um, we have talked about everything there is to talk about in life. I think he knows almost as much about me as my wife Sue does. We're that close. I call him my blood brother. He was going down to uh, <coughs> um, Machu Picchu. We were talking about Neruda. Tender petals for palm, calm, calm crossing. Da! Tender petals for calm crossing. Along this silent path among cliffs through terraced green, you'll sing beneath your breath where the poet once dreamed of his escape through the clouds, where whole populations fled to rebuild shattered dreams, hands in the moist earth. Stone mason, masons who shaped the rock attentively that it might interlock and honor earth that gave both seed and harvest in the sweep of seasons. Ghosts today, they wander with you, picking your pockets to know what dreams you bring to this place, what breath you leave among these rocks, what song you gather in your backpack and basket of silence. Here, the lost mother 
weeping for her child born to minutes of love before its last breath. The father pouring a lifetime's devotion through his hands, his face red with defeated love, yet shining in all the brilliance of that loss. Here the lovers moving together, their short gasps echoing in a great sigh through which another child comes. Here the lost father who could not face the wreck of his love in his own child's eyes. His sorrow like a hermit lost in the passes of his own valleys, his heart bursting with roses he could not bring to his own table. Here, warriors cut down like corn on a day as crisp as this, eyes turning skyward one last time, up to the light as their blood gushes out on fertile ground, shining path where the arms and legs of the dead clutch and kick at heaven. Vanishing dreams of hungry ghosts. So you come bringing blessings and eyes to flush the tears that still pool in the world's grief through all the rages of lost centuries, all the weeping sisters crying for lovers who never appeared, all the brother lost brothers marched through barbed wire to death's final anonymity in the last bursts they'd ever hear, minds turned inward to their mother's cries on the day they forced their way into this light. Compassion now for them all. That your dream be clear when you come to this pass, I send you this wish where tender petals turn open in both darkness and light. Thank you. <clears throat> and now it is my great pleasure to introduce Azizi Jasper. Uh, I've known Azizi for a long time. Of course, some of you know him through Smoke and Spoken Word and all sorts of other things. Basically, his commendatory poem at the Rosa Parks statue dedication, uh, his poem when Reverend Farrakhan was here some time back. How would I describe Azizi? Uh, some of you have heard this, so. He, he is a freight train rolling thumber, thunder. Uh, with trumpets out every window, blasting all at once. He is Grand Rapids' unofficial griot. He is a man whose lungs are so big. Oh, I was listening to him today. His lungs are so big that Bessie Smith herself would open the door to welcome him in and say, this one is good competition, <laughs> ZZ. Thank you, sir. It's, it's, it's an incredible honor to share the stage with you and so many other great writers. So as a black poet, I guess I'm supposed to have a Trayvon Martin poem. But shit, I just barely finished my Sean Bell. Before him, I think it was Nathaniel Jones. I have to write that one as well. You see, my ink runs just as my brother's and sister's blood does, endless like chalk lines in every ghetto America, endless like 41 shots exploding inside of your body would feel because you fit the description of a guy in the area. Tell me, tell me, do you know how it feels to be afraid to call the police? Those that were sworn to protect and serve you, because the thought of us policing our own community for some reason unnerves you. You see, the same mentality that doesn't allow me in their club for black attire is the same mentality that killed Trayvon. Black men have been victims of terrorism for years before Osama and Saddam. Slavery was terrorism. Jim Crow was terrorism. The Tuskegee experiment, chemical warfare, oppression systemic, the crack epidemic, the welfare system is warfare. If me telling this makes you uncomfortable, Good, it should, because frankly it makes me disgusted. Disgusting like the police raping an innocent man in the back of the station with the plunger. As he lay there bleeding on the floor, imagine the emotions of his mother, his father, his sister, his son, his cousins, his aunt, his daughter, his brother. Well, that brother is me, 
So I must be excused for not singing the song you sing. But it's no coincidence that the Liberty Bells crack. They never intended for freedom to ring. And all these types of atrocities will continue to happen if our response is always just march and sing. I'm hard pressed to believe that 50 years later, this would still be the mantra of King. From Emmett Till to Trayvon Still, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And despite my education in speaking the King's English, I'm still the fucking coon that always gets away. As a black man, I live my life in a perpetual hoodie that's brown and it covers my face. Black president or not, you did us no favors in this war against the ism of race. Thank you. <clears throat> I scuff my Tims on the boulevard of broken dreams and such. During sleepless nights when brothers like us don't dream that much. In the third world, the one down the street from the metropolis, around the corner from the burbs so the cops are watching us. Dwelling in the city of gods, there's no subtitles to this flick though. Same old nigga shit just that hip hop replaced Calypso. Bums digging for crumbs, fiends, thievery, and schemes. I've scuffed my Tims on the boulevard of many a broken dream. See, it's jihad in the streets. Revolution, we pray for peace. 85 us, they rest their head on a thousand thread sheets. In tenements, 10 percents, they arouse the red meat, while the other 5 percent, they spit clearance the 13th out of my window. Deciphering the math, puffing the endo, and beef was reserved for outsiders as if they were Hindu. The best of times, the worst of times, the tale of two cities, the blessed to rhyme, cursed to rhyme when life got too gritty. 88 in the mix of the broken down families, broken up marriages, a black ghetto tragedy, our kids living savagely and mama wasn't cooking. Granny, she was tired and pops in Central Booking, he got caught cooking. He mixed the disco with the Crisco, I ran in the contra, hit my people like a missile and back on my block I was shiny like a nickel and hip hop it was mental, painting pictures with the pencil. They called me MC Escher but I do it with the letter, trying to shake the demons but the devil's got the cheddar. It's a thin line between the rhymes left unwritten and those with the prose to fold foes with the addiction, the gift and the cursive, environment submersive. Thank God for this hip and this hop we stayed immersed in. The ball when the hues and the Zora Neale Hurston evolved the confused and they kept us out of hearse when the other options dwindled. We had no friends, just kinfolk. The rim and the range of facade because we've been broke. Living off of wealthy in the heart of my city. The heart of the struggle with the grime and the grit be. We dealt with the dealers to sell young as the hoop dreams as gray brushes spread red paint on canvases of white tees. The ghetto bird hums. The wind blows a samba opus. This grassless yard of mine that passes by, they deemed us hopeless because we were in the ghetto. High hats inside traps. Snare bass and gun claps. Taps and boom baps. Vacate the room raps. Twists like black hair. Relax like smooth naps. Black and blue hue from black and blue slaps. Red and blue lights, so behind bars I'm trapped. Supreme bars I write, supreme bars I rap. Kinda blue the night, my soul kinda black. High hats inside traps, and the bass and gun claps. Taps and boom baps, vacate the room raps. Twists like true lies, reveal like real facts. I gave them hip hop, they played me blues back. High hats inside traps, and their bass and gun claps. Taps and boom baps, vacate the room raps. Twists like black hair, relax like smooth naps. Black and blue hue from black and blue slaps. Red and blue lights, so behind bars I'm trapped. Supreme bars I write, supreme bars I rap. Kinda blue the night, my soul kinda black. I had Hats inside traps near bass and gun claps, taps and boom baps, vacate the room raps. You see, I've been running the wrong way down a one way with a red light. I've annihilated my scruples with dilated pupils while staring in the sunlight. I've been taking chances all my life. The other night I want to fight with the night in a gunfight. Hung tight on the tightrope with the blindfold when the wind blew like a windpipe. I said I've been running the wrong way down a one way with a red light. I've annihilated my scruples with dilated pupils while staring in the sunlight. I've been taking chances all my life, the other night I want to fight with a knife in a gunfight. Hung tight on the tightrope with the blindfold when the wind blew like a windpipe. I said I'm nice with the mic like Jackson, time to engage in the action, dividing the factions, flipping like reciprocal fractions, Franklin's and Grants and them Jacksons, taking all the shit done with asking, call him token because he's black and I'm never broke and I'm never backing, down for the cautious he Jackson, but made in the mitten like a Malcolm, X by the window with the, I wonder what's the outcome, hmm. I got the melody moaning, moon is floating, incense burning, eyes are closing. Mind is open. Ganja smoking, lungs are choking, rhymes are written already, wrote them, raise your focus. 
Save the culture, fakes and vultures, jakes and jesters, haters, hecklers, disrespected us. Disconnected, distant lovers, mistress mayhem, unwed mothers, end of summer. Somewhat sacred, grass is green and minds is grayish, ill demeanor, pound the pavement. Pin the pad, insomniac, cognac, I'm back to black and blue, we're back to basics. Trace the truth, the wisdom, youth to live aloof in land of ham and swine and bacon. The time for truth to rise above the lies, but no one believes because the truth is ostentatious. And outrageous, strangest fruit is dangling, strangling life, that's why our struggle's sacred. From blacks on blocks are slaying the rocks, to Iraqs with rocks are slaying them rocks at cops and tanks. It's all the same shit, off the slave shit, on the spaceship, all the same shit. Songbirds sing sonnets, saturating silence with sonic sustenance. While sober sequences seep silently between sound waves and sorrow. Summer sky sunshine swallows other stars while squinting eyes stare steadfastly seeking something. Scenery as sultry as a southern sister slowly sees in stride surpasses even the Sabbath and its sanctity, be it celebrated on Saturday or Sunday, it seems like somewhat the same scenario still. Shouldering stresses with the strength of stone statues all the while studying stories astutely as to not succumb to those. Selling stupidity subliminally, setting sun strategically like swords swung by Sung Su, seemingly slicing the sanctity of a seemingly sane society socialized by Satan to succumb or starve. So what, some smart someone said, echoing the sound of the sidewalk. So much sadness in these socially constructed slums of ours, yet and still. Songbirds sing sonnets, saturating silence with sonic sustenance, while sober sequences seep silently between sound waves and sorrow. <clears throat> I'm just going to keep going. Um, I should have said this earlier. <laughs> if anybody like wants me to repeat something, like you can yell out rewind, and I will go back and, and repeat it. Um, if, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to change the culture of the night because everything is beautiful, but, you know, if, uh, if an artist, like I've heard so much, so many great things um, today in, uh, in, in, in the prior uh, readers this evening, and the only reason why I wasn't going crazy and snapping and clapping was because I got here late, and no one else was, and I didn't want to be weird. Um, but like, feel free, seriously. Like, if 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 anybody says something that you like, um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right. Huh. Thank you, because I was stalling because I didn't know what I was gonna do. Generalizations of a generation via future hindsight if we don't save it. My generation was filled with rebels whose only cause was rebellion, so so many causes were neglected and fell into oblivion. And opinionated people with miseducated opinions of domestic a domesticated people convinced they have no dominion. My generation was filled with men and women that sought the truth with their eyes closed. Fishing for religion in waters too shallow for God to flow, yet it was deep enough for my generation to drown in. My generation was filled with politicians that manipulated politics, capitalists that participated in politics, so my generation was filled with politics that, politicians that were capitalist. My generation's politics were capitalism. My generation occupied Wall Street. But my generation also occupied Walmart. And those that occupied failed to laser in on one single problem, so the beam didn't remove my generation's tumors. It only shed light. My generation destroyed the environment. Then my generation became environmentalist. My generation hated poverty, but my generation was disproportionately poor. My generation hated poverty, but not as much as it hated its poor, because my generation kept its poor impoverished. My generation allowed Dr. King's legacy to be summed up in five minutes worth of sound bites. My generation allowed a 500-year struggle to be summed up as Dr. King's legacy. My generation was full of social networkers, but my generation was socially awkward. My generation was on the computer all the time, but my generation was still overwhelmingly illiterate. My generation fought to use the word nigger. My generation was ignorant. My generation didn't take care of its kids. My generation were kids when they had kids. My generation called its woman a bitch. My generation was filled with a bunch of bitches. 
My generation neglected his sisters. My generation feared his brothers. My generation locked his brothers in his prisons. My generation made prison an industry. Thus, my generation gave those that filled its prisons an incentive. My generation was gay, but my generation was homophobic. And those that were born gay lost a lot of legitimacy because some were acting and performing, and they blamed it on the down low, and they said it was a phase, while those that died simply to be who they really were were rolling in their graves. My generation raped Palestine, but my my generation didn't see it on TV, so my generation did not know because my generation did not read. My generation overthrew Mubarak and they killed Gaddafi. My gener generation meddled in the Middle East. Then Egypt and Libya and Palestine became more violent than my generation had ever seen. My generation's music was digital, even when it was acoustic. My generation's cameras were excessive and its talent was elusive. My generation thought the TV was reality. My generation lived vicariously. My generation was cellular. My generation cloned its meat. My generation gave dogs and cats immunity, but cows are better known as beef, and my generation gave itself cancer. My generation damaged its health. My generation made health care expensive. My generation equated life with wealth. My generation was pregnant with potential. My generation aborted itself. Generalizations of a generation via future hindsight if we don't save it. <clears throat> All right. Every Every <laughs> All right, so, um, so love and relationships. You know, you wouldn't be a poet if, if you didn't talk about love and relationships. So um, here are several takes of mine on love and relationships. <clears throat> it's dedicated to all of the single friends out there that meddle in your girlfriend's relationships because you don't have one of your own. <clears throat> <laughs> this is called Her Smile Should Be Enough. <clears throat> You've called me a master manipulator, serial data, a player, and all types of other shit. All I was trying to do in that time was find a queen of mine to take to my mothership. Now I know. You say I'm a poet, so hypothetically I should be able to conjure my words and finesse nouns and verbs to be beguiling to that which is feminine. Whispering nothing sweeter than chocolate lace with cinnamon, sweeping any Juliet off of her feet as if I were Romeo's cinnamon. Now the comparisons are flattering, I must admit, but I'm no Montague and I ain't trying to mess with no Capulet. You can romanticize all you want and call it romantic, but any literary scholar would tell you that it's tragic because the moral of the story is the wrong relationship can kill you. <laughs> now, I don't know about y'all, but that's not how I'm trying to go out. <laughs> so in an effort to alleviate the potential of me accelerating my admission into the dead poet society with other women, I've gone out. Yes, some women have screamed my name, and yes, with a few, I've called them out. Yes, some relationships have drug on, and yes, with a few, I've stalled them out. Yes, I've been in love, and yes, with a few I've fallen out, but now I finally meet my Isis. And you want to call Osiris out. <laughs> I understand. She's your friend. And yes, my track record may be a bit crazy, but any man that dates one woman for his entire lifetime is one of three things. He's either ugly, lucky, or lazy. What I've been guilty of is taking a while to make a decision, but my problem with relationships is my problem with religion. If you only experience one, how do you know that it's right? God would not have bestowed colors if things were to just be black and white. And yes, I've loved before, but I've never before been in love. You might think that I'm eating crow, but crows are no more than black doves, so take this as a peace offering, because even if you don't believe me, the smile on your girl's face should be enough. So I wanted to be her last. Indeed, I did. But relationships are a slippery slope, and indeed, I slid. She was the woman of my dreams in that dream I dreamt, the one with the white picket fence and the wife and kid. But dreams, they turn to nightmares. When nights, they turn sleepless. County Cullen and Count Basie, counting sheep until sheepless. What type of man am I, a peaceful man torn to pieces? as I turned to the East and she turned to Jesus, Christ. 
he must dwell in the west because she turned her back to me. The one that took my heart and will not bring it back to me, I would have given God himself for her. And all that statement's blasphemy, but through the coldest winter ever, my sister soldier wouldn't blast the heat. Damn. How cold could woman be? She said only as cold as man made her. It's like my heart is now my rib, there is a hole where I made her. I said my heart is now my rib, there is a hole where I made her, standing here all alone because I didn't control my own behavior now. Lonely is the only company accompanied by all this. F Did the young girl leave? Okay. Fuckery was the. Um, <laughs> in love with her with no one loving me. They say, God, he don't like ugly, and me, I don't like suffering. But my words she takes is mumbling when I'm trying to tell her my thoughts, which to me is truly troubling. But if she was listening, it would hear, it would go a little something like this If love shall ever come again, Knocking at my window, I'll serenade her with a song that leads with a crescendo. My voice will be of pendergrass and my touch will be so gentle. If love shall ever come again, a knocking at my window. If love shall ever come again, the plucking at my heartstrings, I'll grab a pad and pen and write her while a harp sings. Assure her wrong is in the past and right is where we'll start things. If love shall ever come again, the plucking at my heartstrings. If love shall ever come again, the dancing to my music, I'll unplug the drum machine and play her my acoustic. Deep like bass, her eyes I'll gaze will synchronize our movements. If love shall ever come again, a dancing to my music. If love shall ever come again, then taps me on my shoulder. I'll turn all the way around, forever will I hold her. Forever will I cherish her and her name will be our symbol. If love shall ever come again, a knocking at my window. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, cool. Um, love or war? <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, I'll do war at least once. This is something that has nothing to do with either. <laughs> It's called chronology. Today I remember tomorrow as if it were yesterday. In fact, I wrote this next week about the conversation we had tomorrow. The one where you currently tell me you don't understand me and that I'm too hard to follow. As far as understanding is concerned, if I were truly standing under anything, you would be contradicting yourself because to stand requires one to be still. Thus, you wouldn't have to follow me because I'd be right here, which I'm not because I wrote this last week about the conversation that we had tomorrow. I'm a bit too old for school, so I keep it futuristic like yesterday were a week ago. You are my ex who I've stepped out on with with my next, who as of today I have not met yet. Today I remember tomorrow as if it were yesterday. I'm telling you that I told you that I was going to write this. I'm telling you that I told you that I was going to be hard to follow and impossible for you to understand because to stand requires one to be still. But me, I'm here to move you. Today, I remember tomorrow as if it were yesterday. I remember you being here despite the fact that you're leaving now. Today, I remember tomorrow as if it were yesterday. I wrote this next week about the conversation that we had tomorrow, the one where you currently tell me that you don't understand me and that I'm too hard to follow. Tomorrow I remember you being here, but yesterday you left, and today you're leaving. I just hope that you remember me when you do. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I heard war. <laughs> they said that I was sipping on my wine out my chalice, and I got a mind like a labyrinth, and I'm a shooter in the center like a maverick, and all my cameras are candid, and I'm blowing trees like I'm Dorothy in Kansas, a soulful like Dandridge, a revolutionary like a fan is, so infectious like spam is, I'm hardwired, hard-bodied and hard time, the grandiloquence of moonshine spit hard rhymes, reject rudiment, the movement and ain't part-time, I beg your pardon, for those that partake in past times that get slaughtered, it's a thin line between martyrdom and a dumb martyr. I spit fire, I blow trees, I bleed lava. Black pen to black ink to bambada. Rolling roster blunts just like a top shotter. Fight for freedom from Beirut to Asada. Diversified in hard times and ate proper. I'm painting portraits without paint over a paintbrush. Plenty vivid like porn scenes with fake 
Dichotomy like skinny jeans on fat, seen everything from fake queens to real. Real fans with fake friends and in between only go down with the ship if it's a submarine. I learned from the masters and now they study me. And for that, I'll make no apologies. I hit you with the boom, the bap, the boom, the bap, the boom, the bap. I came to bring you boom, the bap, the boom, the bap, the boom. I said I hit you with the boom, the bap, the boom, the bap, the boom. I came to bring the boom, the bap, the boom, the bap, the boom. I said I hit you with the ski wop. Skip it a bee bop to do 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 ski wop. Skip it a bee bop to do 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 do. Girl, I'm gonna get you. Pop locking, non stopping, jaw dropping, do opping and popping until the cops come knocking. I got the tripod in case you wanna pop a rod. Said I got the Venetians if you don't want nobody watching, baby. You see, sister, I'm in the skill in the scheme, but your power best than me can make reality dreams for you, girl. Journey with me to where the lovers will be. Swimming between the sheets like we was under the sea. So let me hit you with the ski wop, the skibbity B. I could hit you with the ski wop, the skibbity B. See, I could hit you with the hip hop if you're liking it raw, but I'd rather hit you with the jazz if you're liking it soft. Going for miles like I'm Davis if you like to go long. Don't mean to toot my own horn, I'm no Louis Armstrong, but if I hit you with the ski wop, huh, skip it to be about funk. Fingers move up and down your body like the loneliest monk with his piano, but erotic, I'm making you jump, baby, and it got me on swole oh, like measles and mumps to with the ski wop, skibbity B. I can hit you with the ski wop, the skibbity B. Girl, if I hit you with the ski wop, I know you're gonna see what a wonderful world this could be. Thank you. <laughs> All right, two more real quick, two more real quick. This is called, um, never mind. I didn't say what any other one was called, so why would I start now? <laughs> Listening, eyes closed, mind open to old soul. Sam Cooke and Sly Stone mentally mixing them both. In a zone it has been long, but a change is coming, I know. Word to Curtis Mayfield, if there is a hell below, we are all going to go when there is, so we are. Everybody's a star, but there's no such thing as a star, because while our stars by cars, our children starve. Money, 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 money. Makes a ball of confusion. It won't be televised. Perhaps that's why we're scared of the revolution. Big up Gil Scott Herman, but hearing me, they're not. Shots all killing our kids, our kids all killing our shot. At a future, and the idea of young, gifted, and black, sung about by Donny Hathaway and Roberta Flack, is killing us softly because we are living for dollars. Marvin asked what's going on because it made him want to holler. Stimulate knowledge so we can grow wise and not just old, and let the music be the only way that we sell our soul. Okay, when I put my hand in the air, I need everybody to say, say what? Okay, it's like really simple. We're gonna try it first though. So. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> I'm penciling a perfect passage. Persistent pronunciations of the eurythmic cadence akin to the palpitations of the ventricle passage. What? I said I'm penciling the perfect passage. Persistent pronunciations of the eurythmic cadence akin to the palpitations of the ventricle passage. Sonic the homonyms and the homophones of the sonic tones and the chronic smoke is hitting your nose, hitting your face, hitting your throat, making you choke all of the while it'll be vibrating past you. I said, I'm penciling the perfect passage. Persistent pronunciations of the eurythmic cadence akin to the palpitations of the ventricle passage. Sonic the homonyms and the homophones of the sonic tones and the chronic smoke. The hitting your nose, hitting your face, hitting your throat, making you choke all of the while it'll be vibrating past you. Vibrating past you with the speed of a zebra we're running from a cheetah. You better believe it. I breathe that the smoke and my breath will blow past you. I said that I'm penciling the perfect passage, persistent pronunciations of the eurythmic cadence, akin to the palpitations of the ventricle passage. Sonic, the homonyms and the homophones of the sonic tones and the chronic smoke, the sitting your nose, sitting your face, sitting your throat, making you choke all of the while it'll be vibrating past you. Vibrating past you with the speed of a zebra we're running from a cheetah, you better believe when I breathe that the smoke of my breath will blow past you. Carrying the cadence of English language like linguists, spitting the mingus improvisational genius, yet so seamless like jazz was. With the pattern that's consistent and rhythmically written, this is the might just leave you breathless, affected with asthma symptoms. I said that I'm penciling a perfect passage. Persistent pronunciations of the arithmetic cadence akin to the palpitations of the ventricle passage. Sonic, the homonyms and homophones of the sonic tones and chronic smoke. The hitting your nose, hitting your face, hitting your throat, making you choke all of the while it'll be vibrating past you. Vibrating past you with the speed of a zebra but running from a mother cheetah. You better believe when I breathe that the smoke on my breath will pass you. Carrying the cadence of English language like linguists, spitting the mingus improvisational genius, just so seamless like jazz was. 
With the pattern that's consistent and rhythmically written, this is a might just if you breath, it's affected with asthma symptoms. In, dent at the stanza, hop position, the banter, the calligraphy written diction with visions of grandeur, continually on a mission to verbally grab you, or gripping the clutch your fist in the air like a panther. Subliminal mind storm, subliminal mind porn, subliminal mind poem, subliminal mind thoughts I'm thinking. Thinking that they faking. I'm thinking that they faking like I salam alaikum plus bits of bacon. I said I'm thinking. I said I'm thinking that they faking like I salam alaikum plus bits of bacon will lake salam plus salami. <laughs> I said I'm penciling a perfect passage, persistent pronunciations of the rhythmic cadence akin to the palpitations of the ventricle passage. Sonic the homonyms and the homophones of the sonic tones and the chronic smoke, the cop came in. <laughs> 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 I said I'm pistol in a perfect passage, persistent pronunciations of the arrhythmic cadence akin to the palpitations of the ventricle passage. Sonic the homonyms and the homophones of the sonic tones and chronic smoke that's hitting your nose, hitting your face, hitting your throat, making you choke all the while. <laughs> It'll be vibrating past you. Vibrating past you with the speed of a zebra but running from a cheetah, you better believe when I breathe that the smoke of my breath will pass you. Carrying the cadence of English language like lingua, spitting a mingus, improvisational genius, just so seamless like jazz was. With the pattern that's consistent and really looking written, this is it might just be breath it's affected with asthma symptoms. Yo, appreciate you, GRCC. This is beautiful. Please give a warm round of applause for <laughs> Professor Cope for making this possible. There are a lot more events to come this week. Please continue to support them. I'm sure he has a lot to say about them. Um, talk to me afterwards about stuff going on, Poetry Rise around West Michigan. 